Hello, listeners. An F familiar tune means it's time once again for the cartoon pad, where the dreamy veil of cartooning is lifted to reveal how the sausage gets made, the nuts and bolts sorted, the I's crossed, the T's dotted, and the ink splattered. Joining us is our producer, Marty. Hi, Marty. Hey, Sha. We'd also like to welcome our new sponsor, the Weekly Humorous, the standard in American immaturity. If it's immaturity you seek, the humorous is fleek. Thank you. <laughs> Marty. Yeah. We're in for a very special treat because this is our first annual book fair. We have a book fair. We do. And our first featured speaker includes a beloved cartoonist, author, author editor, chef, and co-host, Bob Eckstein. Hi, Bob. How you doing, Michael? Is it Eckstein or Eckstein? It's Eckstein. And I like Eckstein. this whole new look for the show. Thank you. It's an overhaul. The show is up on lifts. We're taking yeah. the underbelly. We're taking out the engine. We're retooling it. And I like it. I think we're going electric. We're going EV. So <laughs> let's we get more, right. I, 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 I picture this a little bit more steampunk powered. Ooh, that's good. I can see this show being very steam powered. It's, just, it's so the steam powered podcast. I like that. So we're going to stay on topic and we're going to stick to the nuts and bolts of cartooning so we can better inform our target audience, which is aspiring <laughs> and professional cartoonists. So, Bob, I want to ask you right away, what the hell's in your crock pot? Wow, we were going so good there for a while, and then we just faded. It took us a minute. Um, I am now cooking corned beef. I layered the bottom with onions, chopped up some garlic, added some thyme from the garden, and some peppercorns, and then I added the water and ginger ale. And it's been cooking for like eight hours. And still a piece of mush. Is it ginger mush? ale? Yeah, ginger, ginger ale. Ginger ale's going to stop me there. Is I got this ripe... something, is this like an old wives, you know, te, you know, like, uh, people the, the, like the recipes add... passed down for generation where they've been using, uh, you know, Seagram's ginger ale to marinate meats for a hundred years, or is this something no, you just made up? Because you, you were I didn't make it up. People, do, people use ginger ale. The thing is, is that a lot of people use beer. Yes, um, I would use Guinness. I'm not Irish. I actually don't even have a nationality. You're German, which You're is from the Bronx. I'm not sure what nationality that is, but it's something. So the beer I find overpowers the flavor of the meat. So I'm going with ginger ale, which some people have used before. You don't use all ginger ale. You, you dilute it with water. And um, we're going to give it a taste later. Well, I'm going to send the sandwich your way after this. I love Let's, corned beef sandwiches. The after show party will be corned beef. And on the sidelines, we have sauerkraut, rye bread, some lettuce, and some really spicy mustard waiting. See, there here. used to be a bar down the street from me. I live in, in Park Slope, Brooklyn, and I've, I've lived here for 20 years. And down the street from me, there was this old, like real, like old, like real old bar, like not a fancy bar. It was like a hole in the, a hole in the wall type place. Everything was like this, like splintered wood, like the bar was made of splintered wood. You would didn't care. Like you'd sit there, you get, you get splinters. What do you want? And the bottles of beer, they had no taps. They had rolling rock and it was like, two bucks and they had a great jukebox but the cool thing was for st patrick's day they had they made corned beef they had free corned beef sandwiches all day and they just had the entire long wood splintery bar which is like free corned beef these big aluminum pans full of it and you got bread and they assembled a sandwich and, da, 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 and they would wrap it in foil and they gave you a free sandwich and in my younger days i went and i would take as many free corned beef sandwiches as i could because I was going out all day for St. Patrick's Day, and I'm still wearing the cargo pants, right? Because they were wonderful, and I will not let them go. And I'm filling up the cargo pants, all the cargo pockets, just with free corned beef sandwiches. So I've, I've got like seven or eight corned beef sandwiches in my pants. By the and, and and then we go to different bars throughout the St. Patrick's Day holiday, all you know here in Brooklyn. And I've always just got corned beef sandwich break, and I can just pull it out of the, out of the cargo pants. 
Oh, did you leave a all day. did you leave a trail behind you as you walked? I imagine I did leave a trail of of probably some bread, crumbs, and and uh, corned beef and uh, mustard. So probably mustard on there. Any any cabbage involved, or is it just sauerkraut? Just sauerkraut this time. Michael, do you have a nationality? I thought I was Irish, but I've come to find out I'm most likely English slash Northern Irish. So I'm not. I'm not wearing the green. I'm wearing the orange, laddie. Because of mm. what happened to you trying to be British? That what was that project last year? I just yeah. went that washed away. I got, you rejected yeah. him People too. Right he got kicked out. Where... I got. He got kicked out of the British Cartoon yes, Association. I got, I got Brexited. Are you in touch with those people, or are they showed, have they well, banned you? I haven't touched them lately. I'm planning to touch them again, though. I love your follow through. Yeah, that's me. I am Mister Follow Through. So I gotta go now. Did a great so, intro. So yeah, yeah, let's get back. Let's get back to publishing and the book fair. I see you've got a stack of your new cat books, Bob, over here. Are you are you signing them? Yeah, yeah. Um, I do have a few books I'm working on. I'm working currently on three books. And um, I'm suggesting maybe we bring our guest in to talk about publishing together and we'll talk about our book, The Elements of Stress. We could talk about the cat book, but we could also talk about all sorts of books. What do you think? That's a good idea. I've written a lovely intro for him. Well, let's oh, hear great. that lovely intro. Thank you. So our very special guest sprang from the shores of New Jersey and grew to splendid manhood, drawing strange things from his imagination and playing the guitar poorly. These are two things he's been doing since kindergarten and continues to do this day. As a youth, he wanted to be Frank Rosetta or Conan the Barbarian. He might have wanted to be Bon Jovi after that. Those two fates never happened, but what did happen was success in graphic novels. How graphic will soon learn. His debut graphic novella, Parade with Fireworks, based on a true story about his family's experience in Italy shortly after World War II, was nominated for a Will Eisner Award. Since then, he's collaborated with Pulitzer Prize finalists, media lawyers, and now sketchy patoon podcast cartoonist. His latest efforts, his latest effort, he's both writer and artist of the Nico Bravo graphic novel series published by First Second Books. Nico Bravo allows our guests to indulge in his favorite obsessions, which are as follows, swords, fantasy, literature, mythology, swords, magic, alternate dimensions, swords, swords, hollow earth theory, Atlantis, and of course, more swords. And I understand he does like a good corned beef sandwich. <laughs> so let's bang our flagons on the tavern table for the one and only Mike Caballero. Yay. Hi guys! Yay! Welcome. I hope Thanks you like that intro. Me. Thanks for that uh, intro, uh, Michael. Well, you wrote you it. You guys were doing so well without me. I was, you know, listening <laughs> long. You don't need me to. Maybe you should just kind of keep going. That was all fascinating. Oh, no, we need you. Hi, Mike. We definitely <laughs> no, they need come you. At me. <laughs> big time. We big time need you. <laughs> well, I see that Conan comic book back there. What? I'm not kidding that, about that, the Conan. But it's it would be Springsteen, not Bon Jovi. I got it. I got to jump in there. Uh, Springsteen, not Bon Jovi. Yeah. So when it's you say Rosetta, I'm thinking the, the boss covers. will always be the boss. Mike, did you ever meet Frank Rosetta? I never did. I never went to that museum. I probably, if I had, if I had um, done that, you know, in the early '90s when I was or, or late '80s in art school, I probably. Because but, uh, um, I blew that. Because he's down the street from me. I'm not far from it. I'm in Pennsylvania right now. I'm north of his family's house. And he was in my first book, The History of the Snowman, because the first thing he did as a kid was a comic strip about a snowman. And that was his first like project and brought him some fame. And I included it in my book. And then I dealt with his family to reprint it in my History of the Snowman book. But I got to know the family a little bit just as they were kind of splintering. You know, they had a, a whole thing, a whole drama that was amazing. And I yeah. suspect yeah. that somebody's going to make a movie about that whole drama one day. 
maybe. Although there is a doc, I'm I'm wrong. There is a documentary that just touches on it. I believe the documentary was made when he was still living. So there is a lot that happened after his death, but oh. but there is some touching on the family fighting over the rights and all the estate. It's a, an enormous estate. Uh, I think you're yeah, talking yeah. about Bob Ross, right? No, <laughs> it's the same thing, just a different name. They just switched the names. Interchangeable. I think people are fighting a- a- after the Bob Ross paintings, though. Oh, There's yeah. a whole investigation about where are all of these paintings. And some were at PBS stations locally, and they had auctioned them off and stuff over the years. But someone's got like a treasure trove of Bob Ross paintings, and they're going to be they're going to show up on, everywhere. Yeah, they're going to show up on Storage Wars one of these days. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, yeah, one big somewhere. Mike, you know, um, one question I have for you, which might be the most important question we've ever asked on this podcast. The question that everybody wants to hear the answer to and weighing on all of us is how can one sustain a career in something we love doing? You're someone who's been able to manage just to do full-time illustrating and doing the writing, doing things you love. So I, it's not easy to answer that question in one sentence, but that's something I, I hope to cover because I, I know people want to hear how you've managed to do it. It's not easy. And that's why we're going to talk about publishing because you've done it through books. Yeah, that's, that is a hard question uh, <clears throat> to answer. And, you know, full, I haven't. I mean, let's, uh, if I take it from the beginning, you know, I got, I got into comics in the early 90s. And uh, comics, I mean, like monthly direct market, you know, monthly comics. You know, that, that's kind of where I started. Um, you know, since then, I, I have. I've bounced around web comics. I've, you know, kind of the book market to do longer graphic novels. Um, I've gone back to uh, periodical comics. Uh, I've done animation. I spent about ten years just doing it exclusively, and that—that's really the answer. Is that uh, I, I can do a lot of different things. There's a lot of crossover of the skill sets. I, I don't. Um, kind of restrict myself to just just doing one thing and uh being able to kind of bound on and have contacts in, in you know different fields has kind of kept me going you know in, in that time too there, there were a few years where i was um living in brooklyn i lived in park slope though um i did live there for nine years um and i was living in park slope i was working in publishing making graphic novels I was a member of a studio in town that had a, a bunch of tunas in it who were also being published by, by a variety of, you know, some. Is of this the, the pencil pop- factory? No, um, this was you know you know <laughs> the sorry. Air- calm so down, this calm down, of, Marty. <laughs> this is Gowanus. This was Gowanus. Uh, some. Oh yeah, Gowanus non- is great. So many studios there. down there. I go to figure drawing, and um, most recently, I mean, most recently, like three years ago. I did figure drawing there with a group of people, and there's a bar called Halyards that they all went to afterwards. Oh, and yeah. Herman Mejia is a regular person at the figure drawing. Yes, and I we were just you hanging out, to, uh, and we met, and he was like, "I'm yeah. Herman." I'm like, and he's, "He's like, I'm like Herman Mejia." I'm like, "Herman Mejia, the Mad Magazine superstar." He's like, "Yes, yes, that's me." He was such a nice guy. Yeah, he's awesome. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, at that time, I I, I was. Like I was saying, I, I was working, making comics. I was in the studio with other people who were making comic time. I was working in a in a comic book shop in town in, in Park Slope. So I was frequently um, hand selling books that some of my studio mates had made. You know, the previous it was just a very weird uh, uh, position. You could kind of see the entire scene or the life of a project where you know you you got to see it when it was an idea on somebody's desk and then maybe a year later you know you were to a person and it was really kind of a point of view to see all that but just to say you know i by even doing that you know i i will take a job in a store if that's what i have to do to keep the lights on that that was very vertical because you were working in a comic shop 
during the day and going off to your studio and drawing. So where does the printing come in between the shop and the drawing? Uh, you know, wh what do you mean? Where does, where does the printing come? Comes, well, I mean, comes in between? You, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the kind of question well, that, I'd want to know. So you're drawing a comic, you're selling it in the shop. So in between yeah. someone's got to print it. Yeah. So well, I mean, I don't really, and most of the, most of the artists that I'm thinking of, you know, that I was sharing that space with we're, um, I, I sell the idea before I do the, I don't, I, I, I'm not going to invest like a year drawing something or half a year drawing something if there's not like a, a you know, an agreement to it in between. So, you know, when I, when I'm sitting down to work, it's on a project that, that you know, it has the parameters, there's a budget, uh, uh, there's a publisher, there's an editor, you know, you know, there's deadlines. Otherwise I, you know, I, uh, I'm, otherwise, I'm not working on, right. on something. Right? So it's got to be a project back. for me to, to work. And when you were at the Park Slope uh, comic book store, was that, what was the name? That was on Bergen? Bergen Street Comics. Bergen Street Comics. Yeah, yeah. I walk I walk by there. I mean, Bergen's a beautiful street, and so many places have closed. And uh, that comic book store was such a prime, like, it spot. And I remember in uh, Bored to Death, uh, one of the main characters on that show, Bored to Death, the HBO show with Jonathan Ames, um, the Zach Galifianakis character was a comic book illustrator, and they would always be at that comic book store. So when that yep. closed, uh, which is right by the two three station, it was such a shame. It was a, it, another bookstore opened up, but that comic book store was great. And those kind of places, when you worked there, did artists come in and say, "I made this myself. It's kind of a self published zine, but it was really good." Would you sell someone's work, maybe? Uh, you know, at a, at kind of like a, you know, slight markup, like at, would you take an independent person's work and put it up? Oh yeah. Uh, you know, one of the, this guy, Tucker Stone, who still works in publishing, uh, he, um, he was the, uh, editor. I'm not really sure what his title was for no brow when no brow opened their, uh, New York office. No brow is a, a, a pretty well known European, uh, of, of, you know, sequential art, art books that uh, opened in New York uh, during the time the store was running. Uh, Tucker went to work for them. But what put him on the radar was that he really was a champion of uh, small press and self-published books. We had an entire section for that. It was really a thriving business for the store, that kind of aid uh, stuff, the kind of stuff you'd see at the MOCA convention, which is coming up on April uh, 2nd and 3rd. Yep. That, that had, had a little home. Uh, there in the store, um, it, that place was a real uh, eye opener for me. To be honest, that that store really kind of. I understand a young Keith Herring came in, and you told him to hit the road. Uh, yeah, I think I, I I might not have been there that day, but okay. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, it was a great shop because the owners, you know, they were they were very uh, tuned into the artist community. You know, Brooklyn has a lot of cartoonists. Uh, a lot of them visited the store. Actually, other than the owners of the shop, which is a husband and wife team, team uh, Tom and Amy Adams, one else who worked at the shop was a cartoonist. And I really think it, it gave us, a, it made a different store. Then there's a lot of great comic shops in New York, but I think Bergen Street was very, very special. Really, it, it really had close ties to the cartoonist community, and it really focused on the art of the beautiful brick uh look more and there was always changing original art on the walls and yeah it was always very curated like it wasn't just like a haphazard type of it wasn't like a galaxy comics down <laughs> the street so that place was people, just like a hoarder did you yell at people if they would read and not buy uh no we encouraged it we had a couch we had some very comfy oh, wow. chairs uh, people would spend entire afternoons just kind of uh, perusing the place, but we we did have a really you know they would end up buying stuff usually. That's we didn't of um, you know you curate Looking. that by what you have in the store, and uh, we had a, a very selective collection. I I don't think I don't think our clientele was you know the kind of like read <laughs> no Spider-Man split type. 
We I see the, still a good seller. You did have Archie. Well, there you I go. see the importance Archie. of that, though. You have to have a that. place for people to go, like-minded people, to know they can go and sort of share ideas and stuff and get inspired. And you know, one important thing you kind of said when I asked you um, in the beginning, I said, you know, how do you manage to sustain a career in this is that it takes patience. It, it's someone that you just show up with a wheelbarrow of money in your door but you did start off slow and it, it did evolve. And that being said, yeah. I'd like to know, like, how do you make those steps? How do you go from going from working with a group and now you're independent? And I'd like to know, know also how that is to work all of a sudden alone, but how do you get an agent and how do you go to the next level? Uh, let me think about that. How, how did I make those steps? You know, um, it's interesting. I was, you know, thinking about it this afternoon. I think that my relation to publishing has been kind of adversarial, you know, I had, I feel like I had to really fight in and I feel like I'm, I fight to stay, uh, and, and, and to, um, remain, uh, published, you know, uh, it's, it's, I, I'm not kicking back, you know, it, it's always a lot of work and it's a lot of work every day and it's still a lot of work. Um, I felt very frustrated after I had worked for a few years. You know, I, I, I worked as a colorist. I, you know, um, was not what I wanted to do, but uh, I was also tired of, of washing dishes at the time. And I had an opportunity to start working at a company as a colorist. It's absolutely not what I wanted to do. I wanted to write and draw my own stories, but I decided that this was a chance, right? And so um, it's always a climb, you know, like entering, I had to take a job, but then immediately fight to myself as someone could do more than color somebody else's work. You know, and that, and in, in the early nineties, it was very difficult. There was no graphic novel industry. You know, there was no book market publishers. Uh, there, there were no comics winning calculus and Pulitzer prizes time. You know, it was, it was the direct market monthly comics and they were, it was a fairly narrow, type of story you could tell if you wanted to get paid and make a living, right? So I found that very, uh, and I was constantly running up against all of So I did want superhero stuff and uh, write and draw superhero stuff, which I was not suited for. Then there really was no, so my way of dealing with it was to leave. I, that's where I segued into animation for nine years. I, I didn't do any comics for nine years because uh, it, I thought it was interesting. They, you, Animation people have a, a fascination and a mystique with comics. When they found out you were coming from comics, you, they were like, oh, comics? They, they thought that was very cool. And ironically, the opposite is true. If you go back from animation, it's the same thing. You were born artists, they get very excited. So there's this mystique that happens if that you can kind of parlay into, into something, right? And when I segued into animation, well, I found that um, I felt pigeonholed in comics, but I felt in, and they were like, oh, you can draw. And immediately they put me to work, you know, storyboards, which made a lot of sense to me as a, as a cartoonist. Um, you know, I, w I was able to draw. It was very satisfying to actually get to draw instead of just color other people's stuff. And, and, and then what happened was in nine years, um, I was working at an anime show, um, near um, S, right? And I would take a lunch at St. Mark's Comics. And I walked, walked mm -hmm. into St. Mark's Comics on a Wednesday landed, And there was a whole row of these beautiful graphic novels uh, from a couple I've never heard of. And there was a couple copies of each lined up on their shelves there. And I bought one of um, I was by the quality uh, that there was a diverse um, and I went home and I told my girlfriend, like, I don't know who this is, but I'm going to work for them. And um, one of those books was called Klezmer. It's by an artist named Yuan Spar. He's an Al Al Albanian uh, cartoon. And the book is about a bunch of people from different parts of their life or different 
you know, different parts of their, their country things who become dissatisfied with their debts, drop what they're doing and create a current band and, and go road. And it's, it's brilliant about dealing with frustration and dealing with, um, you know, dead ends, you know, and I was reading that book on the subway, the way to my job at the animation studio and my producer's office. And she looked up and looked at me and she said, uh oh, it was just the look on my face. And I, and she was like, what do you mean? What did I do? What happened? And I was like, nothing happened. You didn't do anything, but I'm on, I'm out. I'm, I'm leaving. And I said, um, I'm going to work for this company. So she said, I said, I don't know what yet. And, uh, that first second, did, uh, 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 Mike, did you take, we could start a band, Bob. Mike was in a band. Klesmer. I did that already. <laughs> was it a Klesmer band? <laughs> oh, you were a guitarist though. <laughs> About about three months later, I was working for them on my my first first second book. It it was foiled. It was written by uh, Jane Yolen, who's written you know uh, she's very well known uh, YA author. Has written like four or something. But um, that was how I segued back into into comics. But what had to happen was this graphic novel evolution, this graphic novel boom. It, it, in in a manner of speaking, like I really had to just wait. The industry that I wanted didn't exist when I started working in comics, wasn't there, right? And there was really nothing for me to do, collaborate in some small way on I didn't really care about. That's what I could have done. So in animation, my drawing chops improved. Drawing boot camp, you know, like I was doing storyboard, uh, you know, you're, you're doing like 30 panels, uh, you know, rough panels, you're not doing finished art, but uh, really, it really, it was towards the end of that period that it clicked for me. My experiences in comics were so demoralizing that I interpreted the idea that I, I wasn't good enough to do them. And what animation did for me was one day I just like sat back and like, I did 30 panels today, you know, 30 panels. I can certainly do six panels. Like that's a page. If I can do a page a day, I can do comics. That's what I learned from animation. You know, I, that I could, could really do comics and, and quit. And that was it. I went back and first second has really been a home mainly because of the editorial director, Mark Siegel. Uh, I just, I really vibe with him. He, he gets comics. Uh, he's had my back for over 10 years. Uh, um, you know, project done a lot of projects with him. He's a great editor. And, um, it's really, you know, without that home, I don't know where I would be or uh, without that um, base, you know, that foundation where I can pitch an idea, you know, uh, I know that be a beautiful book because they're, you know, the production values are, um, they really were, were, they were what I was waiting for. They just didn't exist. So you know, I still I really, have to ask, uh, what, what were you write, drawing storyboards for? First, I worked at MTV Animation uh, when they still had their New York offices, and I, I worked on Dart, and then I worked a lot of the Deathmatch and a couple other things there. And then, um, then as that studio, they shut that studio down, and I was, you know, fortunately able to just there as it was closing to um, a place called Pictures, which was the studio uh, at the place that I mentioned, uh, where I was a Cartoon Network show. Coding Kids Next Door. Um, that, that ran for like six seasons, which was a really long time. Uh, so was that I the worked, early 90s? This is getting into late 90s, oh. getting into the 2000s. There was a real resurgence of anime. I remember when I was so excited when uh, The New Adventures of Mighty Mouse came out. And it was Ralph Bashke. <laughs> it was really good. And I go like, wow. Yeah. You'd watch Rocco's Modern Life. Yeah. <laughs> well, also, I mean, late yeah. 80s, uh, late 90s, early 2000s was like uh, a lot of uh, Adult Swim started. So Adult Swim started something that, you know, on Cartoon Network that became such a juggernaut, you know, Powderpuff Girls, Space yeah. Ghosts, all that stuff, which was at the time, I mean, Space Ghost was just repurposing 
50s cartoons and then adding new storylines and then they started animating new stuff but for a while they were just cutting and pasting old stuff together for fun and it was so funny and i was watching it as a freshman and sophomore you know in college uh I could late watch night a good, we're like what I is this this is hilarious Ghost right now let's i love space, space Ghost. 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 yeah let's go are you are you getting enough oxygen that's what he would do <laughs> and he would just be doing that over and over again <laughs> Uh, but yeah, and then so then there was a huge resurgence in animation. Um, yeah, it was, it was a, boom. a good time it for was you to boom. be doing it. Yeah, Mike, do you remember how you made your introduction introduction to uh, Mark at first second? For instance, I actually submitted something to him not long ago. But people would like to know how do you get your foot in the door to something like that? I cheated. This is not going to be a helpful story. This is what happened. <laughs> Um, I was, I was invited. I had, I had in this studio in Brooklyn, you know, where a bunch of other cartoonists were doing stuff. And, um, a, f a few of them we had a web comics collective called activate, uh, which was just like a couple Brooklyn cartoonists who decided like they were going to do their, their own while they were working, getting paid to do whatever long-term project publishing project uh you know you disappear into those projects like a graphic novel can do a year you vanish while working on a graphic novel so the idea was if you did another thing and you just posted maybe a page or two a week every week you would have something to kind of promote and keep the concept so while you're working on the thing you would do your pursue your own side and just do a, page a week uh and so they invited me to do something, right? And I decided, I got that family story. It's a story that my dad told me in the backyard. You know, we were sitting in the backyard and he just conversation and he told me this story about his dad, my grandfather had never heard before that mind. And I sat down and, and developed that story that I want. And I started realizing that I got about 10 people pages into doing that and I got an email from uh, Image Comics asking, um, do you want to publish? I had never entered mine. Uh, uh, thing anyone would want to publish, right? I was like, oh, I mean, yes, of course, but, you know, I, I guess I hadn't thought of it. So uh, the guy who was running, running that ship was the uh, Brooklyn cartoonist named Dean, Dean Hasfiel. And so Dean and I just got an um, image for, for with fireworks. What should I do? <laughs> and Dean said, "Well, don't go offer. You know, let's let's see if there's offers, right?" So he just immediately sent the link to the ten page posted out to everyone you could think of, like publishers who might be interested in something like that. Fanographics for a second. Uh, you know, um, um, I'm being a company almost, but like, you know, whoever was around at the time that might publish that. And if you go to their websites and follow their submissions guidelines, it's, it may take a six months to a year to respond to your submission. That's what it said. They all say that, right? Um, 15 minutes, uh, I was getting emails from, you know, everybody who were like, you know, and they were like, Eh, it's cool. We're not really sure where it's going. It's, you know, they're mostly pass. I'll pass. It's neat. Thanks for sending. But right? except for Mark Siegel, who was like, let's have, let's get together. I want to talk to you. I want to meet you. That became a, a, a three month conversation about maybe publishing this thing, thing in, in which we failed to come to terms. So published by image, which was the original offer. And in the meantime, uh, Mark offered me he uh, filled the Jane Yolen book. And so I, I got two books. Out. So maybe an answer here, you know, well, then that, that's how that's how I met Mark. And then, and then yeah. another answer to maybe a previous question is, um, you know, having a little self-determination here matters. You know, I, I think there was a psychological thing at that at that moment in time with web comics. Web comics were kind of a thing uh, for this little period of time. And I, and we believed those of us who were publishing at this activate website, we believed that there's a, a difference in going to an editor, admitting 
something and saying, can I do this versus right? Doing it and saying, I am doing this, right? That there, there is something, something turns the table. And what happens is instead of you saying, may I um, and say, can we publish that? That completely turned it on its head. And I wasn't, I mean, we had, uh, we had 11, I think was my last, was 11 of those strips. People just volunteered to, to publish on one page. Seven of those found homes at major uh, publishers uh, in, in comics. So I, I, I feel there was something to that. And I, I feel that, you know, that web comics blip may be kind of over, like the lines are sort of on there. But I did, there is a lot of value in Tunis in in um doing not proposing uh not theorizing but make it you know share some of it uh show show in doing that you get better you show your uh, um that you're there you show publish you can garner an audience that your project has legs that you can meet deadlines and, and that's really what they're for and in the meantime, you're improving what you do as a cartoonist. You're improving as you're doing it, and and, and you're building an audience on your own. You know, subject to something that um, is going to furnish for you. Like I like I said, you know, like my is going to be adversarial. You know, um, it could be the, the aging punk. You know, I mean that, that yeah. that's how music was for me. Music was hit the stage. Don't wait for a label to, to give you a green light and you can go do that. That's what we did. You know, it, my band, we did five U.S. tours in seven other countries and we did that on our own. And I just took that, uh, I just took that in comic. Don't wait for the green light. You know, have to, to do that and push. You know, it's, it's ultimately on you, no matter who you're working, working with, you know. And now is Dire Straits? And that was yes. when you went by the name Mark. <laughs> yeah, the lead guitarist. Mark, Mike, let me ask you something. Um, when you were getting the second book going, did you at that time felt you needed to get an agent? Because I have questions about that because I I do do some books. And um, at some point I was doing a graphic novel and we sent out my book proposal. And they said back to me, we don't want to talk to agents. We want to talk directly to the artists. They and they were mm. frowning upon somebody who is represented. Is that your experience? And did you come up with book proposals feature your books? Oh, the book proposal thing. That's if that's a separate uh, we'll get into that. Uh okay. When I was first meeting for second, then a lot of the other um graphic novel publishers were very approachable you know if you were at a convention let's say you could walk right up to them their table like mark siegel would be at the table charlie kochman would be at his table you could just walk up to people uh they were very approachable very nice it there was no problem as time went on actually the opposite my experience was the opposite um uh right now they're telling you I want to see an anything not, not agented that's what they're that's what they're saying now, which i think is terrible uh, it, it could be a sign that they're just being inundated i don't know inundated with you know graphic novels are gigantic but maybe they, they can't field the, the amount of proposals that they get and that's another obstacle to weed some people out but it's a little random right you're you could be weeding out people very deserving uh, I don't really like that personal <laughs> solution problem, but right now I, I'm kind of seeing uh, evident that they don't want to talk to you if you're not agented. So I, I don't know when you went out, uh, when when it was that you're talking about. It could have happened a couple years ago, or maybe with a. a right now, now I'm getting it. Um, you know, believe it or not, for me it was. It was Mark Siegel who put the idea in my head to get in. Um, we were, were talking about something, and I think he, he could see that I was a little lost when it came to contractual, um, you know, negotiations. Mark, at, Mark actually 
was very helpful with contracts and stuff. It's not really his job to do that. So I think he was like, you know, you, you probably someone who would benefit from an agent. He kind of helped put me in some people and, and I took it from there. And, and, you know, I worked with someone for a while that wasn't so mutually beneficial. And, um, and, and then I started working with uh, Karen Wiseman at a literary agency and Karen's been great. Um, but you see, kind of a partner. Yeah, but you just said like you took it from there. And a lot of people listening might say, "Well, how do you get to that step of getting the agent?" It's not well, just for, taking for me. Mark, Mark, yeah. Mark gave me some names and emails. He oh, said, see. Some, Mark Siegel, you know, gave me some uh, agents that he was working with, who were the other creators second. So he was really trying to help me out. And from there, you know, I just some people. Uh, some of them don't respond. Some of them are to meet you. Let's talk. And and they have like a you know what norms if 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 they get get back to you at all. Um, I think what normally happens is you probably have a telephone, maybe like three or four conversations where you're both kind of trying to feel each out. You know you have to you have to recognize that an agent you are being represented, and it it really is literally what's happening like they become your mouthpiece on certain aspects of of your job right, right. they're they're like what mark the way mark put it in in that station was um it's going to be able to have some of these difficult unpleasant business conversations that that will leave you and i free to have creative conversations so that the one doesn't bleed over into the other and that to me was the was the biggest and best reason to even have someone do that it has that has panned out that my relationship with mark to be this really uh creative one where we have you know really and fun creative conversations about what what's possible in the book right that we don't have to, to debate you know royalties or foreign oh no i agree uh, yeah and i <laughs> And I want to elaborate on this from my own experience. I have an agent who handles a lot of stuff that it's bound to happen, an uncomfortable conversation that you get out of the way. And like in the case of me, I'm dealing with three different publishers. Oops, somebody's um, mic is static. It's yours, Bob. That's you, Bob. No, I'm not touching it. <laughs> you swallowed it. Um, I was going to say was um, I'm it dealing with the three corned beef. I'm dealing with three different publishers and three different contracts. And there's no way I can handle that by myself. Oh, I handle that. Yeah. And, but I want to explain how to get an agent for some people. People are wondering how or, or some other ways of getting an agent. There's things called pitch slams, which take place sometimes once or twice a year. And that gives a chance for people who have no agents to go and show their book proposals to a room, a convention hall full of like, let's say 50 different agencies at once. And that's one way people can get an agent. The other way to get an agent is the, the most desirable way is to build a platform and you get printed, let's say in the New York times or a smaller magazine, let's say real simple or something. And you're doing a body of work that people are starting to take notice and an agent comes to you. Because as you said, if you were to reach out with a cover letter to agents, most of the time, if you reach out to the people in the writer's market, they're not going to respond back. Hopefully you're lucky and someone does respond. But for the most part, you're not going to get people to respond back to you. And the way around that is, is to do it in the backdoor way. Produce work that catches people's attention. And in your case, the web comics. I was curious to know if agents approach you from seeing it that way, if they were trolling on the web. Agents weren't, but edit, ed editors were. And at the time, like, agented cartoonists, agented comic artists were still pretty rare at that time. A book so proposal. It, it wasn't saying, you know, when, when, when I was, you know, doing that web comic thing, that to have an agent wasn't so much of a thing. It swiftly be became that. But I, I want there's there's another thing too, along with what you're saying. You know, you, before you mentioned 
how important patience was, right? And I, with that, another thing I would encourage, uh, you know, younger cartoonists who are trying to move forward is that um, you got to show up, you know. Uh, I, I know the COVID has up everything and hopefully there'll somehow be some kind of end to that. But like ignoring that or prior to that, like uh, going to events and going to places where cartoons are, like, you know, be, being present and uh, part of that um, uh, community for the for the right reasons, you know, not be, not because you're seeking, not because you're trying to climb some kind of ladder, but to be become part of this group of people. It's really a wonderful group of people. And and I would not have a career at all if, if it wasn't for the around me. You know, and that that starts from my former classmates at school who they're the ones who set the first interview that got me my job was was were classmates, right? And uh was, you know, 1988, I was at the Cuba school, right? And I still know and we we still have each other's you know they we we're helping each other find work putting each other in touch with people so uh and 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 then throughout my career i've i've always the cartoonists i've met will bend over backwards to help because what we do and when we see someone who has that who has affection for cartooning and that drive like that you you know you guys that in, in each other you know and, and you you just want to help that person i've done it people have done it for me so i feel uh, this is it's a it's a great community and and I, I, several times i've taken someone's website or portfolio or asked them to prepare a pdf that I, i've sent to my agent to say like check this person out you know they're looking for representation they're they're going to do amazing thing amazing so that's enough, along with what you're saying, but um, other cartoonists can see your, that you're a serious uh, uh, artist and that you want to uh, do things and accomplish things like those people in touch with their agents. That's the door, you know, like um, th there's almost nothing that, a, that, a, that a, uh, an agent can do for you or that an editor can do for you an accomplished cartoonist. I can put you in, I can put you in touch with agents, you know, like a, 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 an established cartoonist can almost do as much for someone trying to get their foot in as any of the other people, you know, and, and usually their criteria is much different. Not wondering about your sales potential. They're looking at your art and they're going to be at your art in a, in a much different way than an editor or an agent might you know so i i think that's a solid route and you know uh, we, you know yeah. we've talked that you teach and i i teach and definitely tell my students like you know, make make connect the artists that you, that you admire you know go to conventions afraid to talk to people approach cartoonists have it have a conversation with you it's really for your career i i would not be working if it wasn't for the cartoonists who, who push forward. You just convinced me to go to the next NCS meeting when I go back into New York City, which I haven't done exactly. in a long time. And it was you who introduced me to them, by the way. I don't know how you and me met, but, but you introduced me. Somehow you had me come on as a guest and I did a presentation. Yes. It was years ago. Uh -huh. And then I, you know, you get so busy and then I wasn't near the area. I kind of left that that circle, but um, that's a very good point. The, but that's exactly what I'm talking about. Like that right there. Yeah. It's a strong network, I, those cartoonists. Except I guess for I have Shaw. to go down to, yeah, I have to go down to Chicago now. Now, thank you. I have to go yeah. find Pat Burns and I have to be nice Oh, wait, to him. who just, um, Ed just moved to you, right? Didn't Ed just leave the New York Yes, he lives in Racine. Group? Yeah. Yeah. You need to get together Where with them. I know. I know. See, the Midwest is the great uh, diaspora of cartoonists uh, scattered <laughs> hither and yon. So it's a little hard to be a 
community. Mike, about the book proposals, it is too much of a subject to cover right now, but really just quickly, one quick question I have is the question of how much do you show a publisher or an editor when you're pitching it? Because if you're doing like different genres of books, it's like different criteria for each one. And when it came to the graphic novel, when I was pitching my book, I got responses back from some people. Um, I think it was Gary from Fanographics who said, please send mm -hmm. the whole book. And that might Ooh. be because I've never been published as a graphic novelist. I would not do that. <laughs> you know, a lot of them, the standard is like a one, a one page this, um, and, you know, character descriptions and stuff like that. And then, um, you know, maybe pages of lettered thumbnails, you know, so they can be loose, uh, but legible to a non auditor type, right? With maybe with real lettering. And then maybe a finished piece of artwork, some kind of teaser image to kind of show what the, what the final art would actually look like. That's a pitch. I am you don't need, you don't need to do show it. comps and show that you know the market? Like sales um, numbers, Bob? Normally, what you ask that in my experience. Not, uh -huh. right. not I mean, in my experience. Not that. They, they, they ask because for if I'm doing a nonfiction book, it has to be a presentation showing that you understand the competition and that you're showing the comps that are on the market now. Well, I don't fiction. I mean, the, the, the closest I got to that was this recent uh, free speech handbook. And I, I don't know that that was in the proposal. I think I, you know, I saw the whole proposal. I worked with, you know, I collaborated with the writer and yeah. I, I believe I saw this whole proposal wasn't there. If that was something that his agent maybe compiled, um, it could, maybe that wasn't included and forwarded to me. But, um, yeah, don't don't agents already know the market? I mean, see if you fit. And is that well, no, they, job? I'm talking about the book proposal, though. I'm saying right. how much of a. But let's segue into free speech, which we um, want to talk about. It's your latest book. Uh, in this case, you just illustrated it with someone. Did you know the author? Did how did you guys meet? No, no, we met. We were introduced for a second because the news broke that first second was this line of book called World Citizen Comics. So there, there, it's it's still first second. They they were creating this world line of civics novels, so nonfiction books dealing with, you know, civics subject matter, such as that we don't have in public schools anymore. And that it was all over the comics news. And I, um, this was happening during the Trump administration. I was as fed up and angry as everybody uh, I know was. And I was trying to keep my, uh, I was trying to keep that off my social media. Um, I don't, I didn't feel it did any, it was really like had my eyes out for, what can, uh, how can I use what I do to kind of get this off my chest and to sort of, you know, do, do something to push back against what I'm seeing in the news every day. And I saw World Citizen announced and I wrote like, this is, sounds great, congratulations, I'm proud of you. And if there's any for me to contribute, you know, keep me in mind because I would love to contribute something to this. And he wrote back immediately and he said, I just got this in my inbox. And it was Ian Rosenberg's proposal. For that book paragraph of his proposal he he uh talks about uh know your rights by the clash which is one of my favorite bands and i was like and that's how i met ian and you know went from there this book you did a beautiful job and what i love most Thank about you. your style is that it's honest and not pretentious there's no airs you put on it. it i love the simplicity and the clarity that you have and it's perfect for what the message is it's a no-nonsense thing. Um, That's how what is, I was going for. Oh, well, you achieved it. Uh, can you tell us a little more about the book so people understand what... Well, I have a copy of it right here. It be backwards when I showed it. I guess it's my words or something. It looks back, backwards to me. It's been backwards for four years. What Ian did was he took, um, he took 10 current events cases in the headlines, so to speak, like uh you know issue the the women's march uh 
Kaepernick take a knee. Students have the right to uh, walk out uh, in protest against et etc. Uh, were happening fairly currently, and he and so each chapter spotlights one of those issues, and it um, marries those a um, pivotal Supreme Court decision of the past, um, and 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 it goes fairly chronological way, and it, it has to answer answer the Supreme Court, or uh, sorry, the, the first question at the, at the root of each of those, these previous Supreme Court cases. And um, it was a uh, you know, crash course that I had no idea. I, ne I never read before. And um, you know, I, I read the manuscript over a weekend and wrote, Ian, you know, I was, I was thrilled. I was enraged. <laughs> I, I just really blew my mind and it kind of ran the gamut of, of emotions. Um, and, you know, what I, what, another, another thing that's kind of amazing about it is you realize how really new our concept of the First Amendment really is, you know, because the, the first earliest case that really starts to define what we think as free speech is, is a uh, case around, you know, the, the turn of the century. Uh, during uh, during World War you know, so the early part of uh, the 20th century, that's fairly recent. That's that's the decision that leads to like the, the market, the idea of the market of, of uh, ideas, right? Which really is the cornerstone on which our our concept of the First Amendment is based. And when you realize that this, we're talking 1920, it's uh, amazing how much free speech has really um, really in the 20th century, you know, it, it really, um, it, it barely exists. And, and another thing that's, is that this, this uh, Congress shall make no uh, restriction to, you know, your, your speech. That, that's all it really says. Uh, that, that this idea was parked in the Bill of Rights and was put there without really fleshing out what it was. It really didn't it really didn't get fleshed out until learning at that time. But to me, it's there. Uh, and that's the fascinating thing about that history is the moments where the decision probably should have been made. At all, everything points to the wrong decision, and yet uh, they don't. They, they, they make the morally right decision so many, many times. It's really staggering. It's it's inspirational. It's also frightening how fragile it is and and how easy it could have gone away. Um, it, it really was, you know, I I fascinating. I learned a lot, you know. Um, and and in terms of doing art, I just I just try to stay out of the way of the script, you know. Just just like you said, just keep it simple. Uh, trust the script and and stay out. Boy, I feel woefully un undereducated now. So. You should That's get the book and you can you read it. I know. And then you will so be. I, I, yeah, I need to get the book. Is it, was it a graphic novel or did you illustrate the story? Yeah, it's it a graphic, a... it's totally graphic novel format. Comics. Wow. Oh, that looks great. You know, so I, did, um, I, was it, I did it ever get sold as a textbook? On, on a couple of things. I, I, I thought about Paul Coe Jr. Sure. When I was trying to, I was trying to like, well, what does this look like? A script. You know, what does this look like? And I thought Paul Coker Jr., um, Sir James, and um, I, do, I don't know, I don't know of any particular, I assume there were a couple, but I always say uh, Cool House Rock, like my stew. Yeah, you're just a bill. Like, you're just classic. a classic. Like, it's it's Mike, interesting what's... that, sorry, sorry, Bob, but. I was just going to ask Mike, would... what's, the, what the, what's the intended age group? That you were thinking, um, teen, teens and adults. You know, uh, I'd say starting around. Uh, you know, I, I think in school around eighth grade they start to study the the Bill of Rights. So I think it's, it's that in school, then I think the book is is appropriate after that point. I think younger than that, I don't think it's necessarily appropriate, but I just don't think they're going to get much out of it. You know, so their teens and and adults. So this could end up being in a, in a syllabus. Absolutely. I think some syllabus are, are picking up.
could be a textbook. Yeah. It could yeah. be animated. Absolutely. It could be you could, produced. You could run afoul of some school boards. I, you know, all that would be good. Oh, oh, yeah, it would I'll, be good. I'm open, I'm open to all. <laughs> Bob, we're just not I, controversial enough. Yeah. Yeah, we have to get uh, Tennessee pissed off at us. Uh, that should be easy. Yeah, yeah it should be easy. They, they we, don't like you. They're anyway. banning everything. <laughs> Mike, what are you going to work on next? Do you have any ideas of what your next project is? Well, I've been I've been doing this new book Bravo series, which you guys already. This uh, first book, second, book, third book is out in August, and uh, I'm working on what I consider, I consider it book four. I think the publisher considered kind of a spinoff. Uh, Nico Bravo has a, a vast cast of characters, and my intention was always that you could just change into any one of these uh, characters. So with book four, we're gonna spot. It has been porting character, but we're going to give her her own book, and and if I can do more after that, that that's that's uh, what I'm drawing right now. It's written, um, and I'm just sort of uh, I'm drawing right now and move on to color and hopefully it up in the next few months. That's smart to focus on another character. I always thought I would love to see a movie that's just Felix Leiter. From James Bond. James Felix Leiter was a CIA contact that always would get Bond to do stuff. And he was like the American version of a, of a secret. And then you never really see Felix Leiter do very much. And I, I was always kind of like, I want to see Felix Leiter in a movie. Or, or you know, he could be on a spinoff. And, then, and they never uh, did it. Marty, Felix is dead. You don't have to spoil James oh, Bond sorry. for every single person <laughs> listening to this podcast. Not that I accept that most the recent James movie. Bond. It didn't even happen. We'll be happen. back. Everybody will be back. Felix isn't gone. So, Everyone's fine. Mike, are you Nico? I keep thinking you're Nico. Uh, I think I'm a little bit of all the main characters. I think, you know, uh, I'm, I'm certainly there's a lot of, I'm a lot of Nico and, and Marissa, but I think I'm a little bit of uh, definitely of all of them. They're all me. You know, the, uh, the dialogue reads at a very advanced level. I'm, I'm impressed that kids will, actually absorb this and you know um uh, i think like a lot I... of I've heard, I've heard so many uh you know middle grade and children's book writers i think say the same thing we don't i don't write for kids i, I never think that i'm writing for kids when i'm writing i i really entertain myself you know i uh, i'm trying to laugh i'm trying to surprise myself uh with, with what they do next um, so I don't, don't, I don't ever try to write for kids. I never let that happen. You know, right. if I can avoid it. If I did, it's, it seems that I, I don't do them. No roly polies. No, I got no, no painful alliterations. No, you know, the kids get it. Kids are smart. They're, they're a lot smarter than they get credit for often and kids like to read things that are not meant for kids you know totally. kids always will gravitate yes. towards the thing that isn't for them anyway because that's what they want they don't want the thing that's no. made for them they want and the this thing book that's is made full for of them. knives totally. this book is full of knives too, which is cool <laughs> it is mike do you have kids no i have a turtle do you have but to I like have... kids to do children's books that's a don't, question. I don't dislike kids. I like, you know, I, I, I think to do children's books, you have to be a kid. <laughs> I don't think you have to like kids. I think you have to be a kid. And I, you know, I don't think I'm much different than I was when I was, you know, and really I have less hair. Um, but, uh, I think you have to be in touch with, I think, to make it work. Um, I I like kids, but, but I also like to go home have no kids there when you know I I like us kids. <laughs> it's like so other I can leave. And go home. Yeah, like other people's dogs. <laughs> well, you know, like if you, I mean, like Sendak was the same way. I he didn't write for children; he wrote for himself. 
if you ever read ever read Shrek, I think it's good books. If you yeah, I do I agree. It. I don't know what it is. Don't write for kids, Bob. That's not. I'm writing that down. Yeah, no kids. Don't have kids and don't write for kids. <laughs> I mean, Shrek are, is pretty. Those are two good rules to live by. Yes. Yeah. Well, Mike, I don't want to keep you forever because you sound like a very busy guy. And I know that you actually taught today and you're teaching at School of Visual Arts. And uh, that's right. Anything you want to add about that? Has that been still satisfying? Will you continue teaching there? Yeah, you know, for the foreseeable future, I, I, uh, it's kind of what before I love seeing uh, the ideas that the, you know, my students are juniors and seniors, so they're, you know, they're kind of reaching the, their time at SVA. Uh, many of them are very accomplished cartoonists. Uh, there's many of them are, you can see it, you, you see that they're ready to work. And they're doing, um, you know, they're bringing in influences of, of things that happen behind me that I, I'm not aware of. Um, it sort of keeps you sharp, you know, to be in touch with, uh, you know, really the, uh, the coming wave of, of graphic novelists like Wing. Yeah. Um, what's it, the uh, shift there's, you're there's seeing? Almost a, Sorry, what's man. that? What's the shift you're seeing in, like, high school kids perceptions of graphic novels i mean is there anything that's really surprising you um i feel like the, uh, one thing I, I feel like that when i think back to what i was doing when their age they're a lot better their 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 work <laughs> is much visualized and, and realized you know it, it it's it's much more sure work in just in terms of the craft I, I, and then maybe you know we we didn't have Photoshop. You know, said so you can really uh, you can your stuff can look very professional. So the stuff looks very professional. Um, there's there's more and more, more. There's a there's a focus on doing work, which I think is the best thing and the greatest thing. The kid, kids from my generation, when I entered the Joe Q, you know, you know that person wanted to. That person wanted to work for DC. This person wanted to draw a fan. Or like the 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 imagination of what you could do in your career was so narrow. Is that's not? I mean, that's the degree, but it's much broader. And there's a, a greater focus and maturity on doing your own and stuff that you created, which I'm a huge advocate for. And it's great to see. You know, it's great that students aren't. Um, pining to be a e for a corporation, you know. I want to see them make their own work and have their own voice, and and um, and that's really, you know, if you were that kid in my day, you were the weirdo reading Love and Rock. You were the weird kid in class. You didn't didn't read. That's right. You were the outlier. So that has become the most of the kids. Kids have their own ideas of, of what they want. They don't want to draw from Marvel at all. They don't care. I think it's great. Wow. That's our bombshell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You've been teaching us, Mike, this has been like a crash course in graphic novels and stuff. And we can do a six parter because there's so much to talk about. I mean, um, I was thinking about how things are exploding as I'm learning about 3d cartoons, mm -hmm. 3d cartoons mm -hmm. where you actually walk into the scene and you could uh, go around and you could explore within, you know, the dimension of that. But, um, yeah, we have to have you back one day. And I don't want to keep you any longer, though, because we went over an hour. And uh, it's been really I, great I, to I'm, have you. My girlfriend tells me I'm long-winded. I, I, I don't have short answers for anything. No, it's been really great. I mean, it's very helpful. Yes, you're surprisingly interesting. So don't worry <laughs> about it. <laughs> Yeah, Michael wants to talk to you on the side later about co-hosting a podcast. <laughs> Are we getting replaced already? <laughs> I should be. That's true. Thank well, you, it's, it's been great. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, you're right, Bob. I mean, I can talk comps forever. Uh, it's, you know, my favorite. And there is a lot to talk about, uh, which is great. There's a lot going on. There's a lot. 
lot happening in comics and, and in publishing. Uh, it's good, you know, uh, I could talk about it forever. Your passion is contagious. So thank you. Um, yeah, um, Michael, let's Where can wrap people up. follow you, uh, Mike? Are oh. you on Twitter, Instagram? People want to check out your work. Where Where do they go? Uh, I am on. Uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, I'm on Instagram. I can remember. That's Mike Cavallaro Art. And okay. uh, Twitter, I can't even remember what it is. But you know, if you go to MikeCavallaro.com, uh, you can find links to all that anyway. So that might be the best place to start. MikeCavallaro.com. If you spell it right, you'll. We well, will let's send spell your name. There. Let's spell your name. It's C A R. I mean C A V A L L A R O. I R B A R L O. M O U S C. Mike, you do have a nice website. So are, I was enjoying yes, it. Yes, he does. So you don't have to write for kids. You, you, yeah, you, you don't you ask down. For, just you, just write. Right. You ask for forgiveness, not for permission. There you and go. if you buy a sword, make sure it has full tang construction. Yeah. Good advice. Yeah. There we go. Well, on that bombshell, it's time to close the curtain on another cartoon pad. Many thanks to Mike Caballero, Bob Eckstein, and Marty Dundix. And remember, if it's immaturity that you seek, the weekly humorous is that is the fleek. This is your announcer, Michael Shaw speaking. Good night, everybody. <laughs>